Do you ever feel like you lack purpose, like you lack confidence, like you're afraid, like you're alone, like you're lazy, like you're lustful, like you don't know what you're supposed to be doing and you just wish somebody would tell you how to get where you want to go? If you're anything like me, you have felt that way and you probably felt that way for a while and you don't know what to do about it. So in this video, I'm going to give you all of the advice that helped me to change my life from somebody who lacked confidence and lacked purpose and lacked any real drive or direction in their life to somebody who now has an incredible amount of purpose, an incredible life, an incredible family, and I'm able to do the things that I feel like I'm supposed to do that God is calling me to do without fear and without hindrance. I know that these things work because I have used them in my own life to go from somebody who was directionless and lost and no purpose in life other than to please myself into somebody who now I feel like I have an incredible amount of purpose and I have ministry work that I'm doing and I have people that I'm here to help. So I'm going to help you to go through that transformation so that you can become the husband, the father, the priest, the man, and the saint that God has designed you to be. So the first thing I want to talk about, and this is incredibly, incredibly important. If you get this right, you'll notice that your confidence goes from wherever it is right now through the roof. If you can take this shift your perspective and start to apply it, you'll notice that you don't have issues with confidence anymore. This is what you have to do. You have to, whenever you're engaging with people, right? Because a lot of us get into this idea that, oh, I'm awkward in social situations or, oh, I don't know what to say or what to do. But listen, literally everybody has that issue. There is probably less than 1% of the population who doesn't ever feel awkward in social situations. The other day, my wife and I were on a plane and my two-year-old daughter dropped one of her toys and it rolled under the seat to the person behind us and they were reading a book or something so they didn't notice. And I had to muster up the courage to do something as simple as say, hey, my daughter dropped her toy. Could you please pick it up for me and hand it to me? I'd really appreciate it. But even in that situation, I still felt a little bit of social anxiety. Don't let that social anxiety define you. We all have it. We all have moments where we feel weak or insecure or, ah, what am I going to say? But if you take this one little trick and you apply it, you'll start to be able to converse with people in a way that's beneficial for both of you in a way where you feel like you're contributing and producing something beautiful in that person's life. And it's not all about you. And this is the key to have confidence in conversation. Focus on what you have to offer and not what you have to get. Because a lot of people will feel very nervous whenever they want to, let's say, go up and talk to a girl who they think is pretty. And the reason that they feel nervous is because they want something from that person. They want to get something from that person. And they're afraid that they won't get what they want. And so they feel insecure. If you can shift your focus and focus your conversation on what can I provide to this other person? What can I give away for free to this other person? What value can I put into this person's life? If you shift your focus that way and you try to be a benefit and a help to the person that you're talking to, then you're going to find you have a tremendous amount of confidence. And why is that? It's because men were made to provide. We are providers. And so whenever we shift our focus and start to become consumers, start to become feed me, my desires, this is what I want, we're shifting our nature and it feels awkward and it's supposed to. If we can be men and focus on what can we provide to the person that we're talking to, then we're fulfilling our nature and it's going to feel much more natural. And we're also taking the focus off of ourselves and putting it onto somebody else. And so even if we're deficient in something or we're not doing things perfectly, if our focus on, is on how can we best serve the person that we're talking to, how can we provide value to their life, then we're going to be okay. And the value that you provide could be as simple as a charming conversation. It could be as simple as just having a nice chat with somebody. It doesn't have to be extravagant life advice or something like that, but just provide value to that person in some way. Jesus says the greatest amongst you shall be the servant of all. And I would even go so far as to say the most confident among you shall be the servant of all. The more that you have to offer, the more that you feel needed and accepted and loved by other people because you can provide them with something and something of great value. And if you're saying, oh, I don't have anything of value to provide. Oh, I don't have anything to give in this conversation. You're lying to yourself. You do have something. And maybe you don't have as much as other people. Just be real with yourself. Maybe you're not as socially skilled as other people. But social skills are skills. They're not magic talents that people are born with. It's nothing like that. 
Your social skills can and should develop the more that you age. Social virtues are real virtues. Knowing how to have a conversation with somebody, knowing how to make eye contact and smile at the appropriate times and nod and focus the conversation on them and not on yourself, knowing how to do all of that, it's a skill. It's a skill and it's learnable and it's teachable. So if you feel like you're awkward in conversations, this is what you need to do. You need to come up with three questions that you can ask the other person about themselves and you need to make sure that you're presenting yourself in a way that is acceptable and nice and easily received because it's difficult to come up with things to talk about just on the spot. It's very difficult. So if you have three preconceived questions that you can just present to the other person, hopefully the conversation takes off from there. And if it doesn't, it's probably a them problem and not a you problem. Assuming that you've made sure that you don't smell, <laughs> you've put on deodorant or whatever, you've brushed your teeth, you don't look like a slob, but you look like somebody who's worthy of having a good conversation with. So that's point number one, focus on what you can provide in a conversation and not what you can take away. This will cause your confidence to skyrocket. And point number two, and this is incredibly important, it ties into point number one, is competence produces confidence. Whenever you have a skill, a valuable, marketable skill that you can provide to other people, then you feel confident because you can provide. Those who provide are confident. Those who always seek to take are insecure, always insecure because they could be rejected at any moment. If what you're trying to do is give, you will find peace and confidence. If what you're trying to do is take, you'll find the opposite. So you need to be able to focus on giving whenever you're having conversations or whenever you're in social situations or whenever you're with your friends. Always be thinking, what can I do to help this person? And then have something that's actually valuable to offer. If you're a young man in your 20s, you need to start developing some marketable skill. What can you do or what do you want to be able to do? Can you sell? Do you have sales experience? Can you grow a business? Can you do online marketing? What can you do that is a profitable skill? Because if you're a man and you can barely take care of yourself financially, you're never going to have the confidence that you need to take on a wife, to start asking women out because you're going to know that if they say yes, oh shoot, what do I do? I can't take care of them. So you need to, if you're a young man in your 20s, come up with some marketable skill that's going to be able to provide for you and your family. And once you have that, you'll have something really valuable that you can give away in business and that'll overflow into your life and you can start giving away value in conversation. So point number two, be competent, develop skills and develop them quickly. Because if you develop a skill in your early 20s, you have that skill for the rest of your life. That could be 60 years of skill that you have. If you develop that same skill when you're 50, then maybe you only have 30 years with that same skill. So the quicker that you can develop skills, the more valuable you become for the rest of your life. Invest in yourself and invest heavily. Educate yourself, make connections, develop skills, and you will become somebody who is incredibly competent and then you will become incredibly confident if you focus on giving your competence away. So point number three, and this is a mistake that everybody makes at some point in their life. Everybody thinks so-and-so is so brave and so confident, they must not have any fear. They must be absolutely fearless. Listen, maybe there are some men out there who are fearless, maybe, but fear is an emotion. And it's not something that even people who are incredibly holy have perfect control over. Fear is an emotion. So to be confident does not mean you don't have the emotion of fear. And to be fearless doesn't mean you don't have the emotion of fear. What it means to be confident is that perhaps you have an emotion of fear. You feel frightened or you feel little or you feel like you're out of your league. Perhaps you have that emotion and that happens. It happens to all of us. But a confident man will recognize, okay, I'm experiencing this emotion. This emotion is not reasonable right now. It's not helping me to accomplish my goals. So I'm going to ignore it. I'm going to overcome it. And I'm going to behave in a reasonable way, even though I feel afraid. That's the key. Fear is not the opposite of confidence. You can be confident and afraid. Every soldier who's ever gone into battle before the battle starts, they get adrenaline. They get a surge of adrenaline, a surge of energy. That's something like fear. 
but they don't let it rule them and they use their reason to govern their emotions. They use their reason and they're not overcome by their emotions. So if you feel afraid or awkward or nervous in conversations like that, that's totally fine. That's expected. That's what everybody feels. But the people who do well in life are the people who act the way that they're supposed to act anyway. They're the people that realize, yes, I'm afraid right now. I'm scared to go up to this girl and ask her on a date, even though I think that that's the right thing to do. The good men act anyway. They do it anyway. So fear is not the opposite of confidence. And the fourth thing is we have this idea as men that good enough is good enough. I have one fear that predominates all of my other fears that is a huge decision-making factor in my own life. And this fear, I think, is a good thing. I think it comes from God because if we fall into this trap that the society, the culture has set for us, then we'll end up like everybody else and we'll end up mediocre. What we've been called to do as men is overcome our vices, slay our demons, and become saints. Too often, men will make peace with the enemy. They'll make peace with their vices. And when you stand before God and God asks you, why do you still have this vice? I gave you everything that you needed to overcome it and you didn't. Why is this still here when I commanded you to get rid of it and I gave you everything you needed to do so? Why is this still here? You're going to have to answer for that. So as a man, do not ever make peace with your vices. Good enough is not good enough if you are a Catholic man who wants to be a father and a husband and a saint because your small faults today will become giant vices tomorrow. C.S. Lewis talks about how both good and evil grow at compounding interest rates. Your small vices today turn into mortal sins tomorrow, and your small virtues today can make you a saint tomorrow. So whatever you do, find your biggest vice, find your principal fault, and wage war. Attack it. Cut its head off. Stop it at the root and become the man that God is calling you to be. And this ties into the fifth piece of advice. You are not as weak as you think. You're actually much weaker. And that's a good thing. The devil lies to us and he tells us that we're weak. And he's only right if we believe him. One of my favorite stories about Mother Teresa is when she was in India, there were a lot of poor people that she was helping and she was not incredibly popular because she was Catholic and not Hindu. And Hindus believe in reincarnation, so they believe that if you lived a bad life, that's why you ended up poor, so they don't really help the poor very much in India. So Mother Teresa was trying to beg and get money from a man who owned a restaurant. She went up to this man and asked him for money. And the man, knowing who she was, and knowing that she was Catholic, and knowing what she stood for, spit in her face. Mother Teresa then calmly wiped the spit off of her face and said, Thank you, that was for me. Now do you have anything for the poor? And this man was so moved by her self-control that he ended up giving her money, even though he didn't support her cause in any other way. So what we can see here is that God is incredibly powerful. Mother Teresa is nothing in and of herself, and she would tell you that much. She called herself a pencil in the hand of the Lord. Mother Teresa is nothing by herself, but with Christ and with Christ in her, she can overcome even that incredible, incredible disgrace. St. John in the inspired scriptures tells us that he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. That means that if you are in a state of grace and you're humble, then Christ is dwelling within you. And Christ can overcome the entire army of hell easily. Satan is not very powerful, but he is very clever. And the way that he defeats us is by tricking us into thinking that we are weak. We are not weak if we have Christ within us. We are not weak if we are in a state of grace, frequenting the sacraments, making regular confessions, and praying. The devil is afraid of us, and we have no reason to be afraid of him, because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. So remember that power, the power of God, the power of Christ is made perfect in weakness. In your own recognition of your own failings, you are able to Ask Christ to step in and to help you and to move you and to transform you. But you first have to recognize your own weakness. So if you feel tempted, you must, you must surrender that temptation 
to Jesus Christ and ask him to take care of it. And he will. He wants to. He wants to take care of your vices and get rid of them even more than you do. Jesus Christ tells us, without me, you can do nothing. And he means it. And in order for us to give that power to Christ, in order for us to let Christ into our lives to overcome our vices for us, we first have to recognize our own powerlessness and say, Jesus, even this small temptation is too great for me to overcome. I place everything, everything in your hands. Please take care of this. Redeem me. Save me. Do not let me fall into this vice again. And he will be faithful to his promises. Pray in the holy name of Jesus and ask him to wash you in his precious blood. And the temptations will start to melt away. And this brings me into my next point. Most of us have this idea some of the time that God is far away or he doesn't care or he doesn't notice. That's a lie. That's just an absolute lie. If you understand anything about metaphysics, you understand that God has to sustain this moment in being in order for it to exist at all. God sustains things in being the way that a light bulb sustains light in being. If you flip the switch, the light stops and it goes out. So we know that God is holding us in existence in this moment. We know that God doesn't make mistakes. And we know that God doesn't make things that don't matter. So we have to conclude that even in this present moment, God is with us and he cares about what we're doing, what we're saying, what we're thinking. He cares about all of that. He knows how many hairs are on your head. He knows how many air molecules are in your lungs right now and how many electrons are on each one of those atoms. He knows all of that and he's sustaining it in being because he cares and he cares deeply. So the number one most powerful weapon in spiritual warfare is simply remembering the presence of God and remembering that he loves you and cares for you and he only treats you in the way that is best for you in each and every moment. If we can recognize that and see that and see God's hand in our life, then all of a sudden the temptations and the crosses and the things that we've been struggling with for years, we can start to see those as occasions of grace, as God shaping us and trying to make us holy and bring him to himself. So even right now in this moment, just take a second and recognize God is with you. God is present with you. He is here and he is now and he loves you and he loves you deeply. He wants you to be closer to himself. So he's giving you, even in this moment, all of your present circumstances. He's the one that brought you to this video. Even though I am incapable of helping you in any way, Christ himself can work through me and speak through me to help somebody out there who needs to hear this message. Next point, and I think that this is incredibly powerful, and this is arguably the thing that makes a man a man. And it's not something that you'd expect exactly because it's not something that's talked about in the culture. We watch movies and we see all these macho men who don't have any problems. And then the bad guy comes and does something. And then the man has to take vengeance and restore his good name. And it's all about him. And it's all about what he wants. And it's all about his desires and satisfying them. But what a real man does is he is humble. A real man does this. He refers all the glory and all the honor to Jesus Christ. And he takes all the blame that he possibly can for himself. And this will make you powerful. Why? Because if something is somebody else's fault and it's completely out of your control, there's nothing you can do about it. It just happened to you. And if you start to think, oh, it's not my fault, it's not my fault, it's not my fault, then your life will happen to you. It will happen to you and there's nothing you can do to change it. You will become passive. You will fall downhill and you will go in the path of least direction every time. You have to start to say, this is my fault. And if you say that sentence, you just accept the blame when blame is due to you and even possibly when it's not due to you, then what you're doing subconsciously is you're twisting your mind, you're shaping your mind, you're reforming your mind so that you see things as your fault, meaning you could have done better. And in the future, you can do better. So if you want to change your life, you have to escape the victim mentality. Your life does not happen to you. Bad things that happen to you, there's something you could have done to fix it, to prevent it. There's something you could have done to make that better and you failed. And so in the future, whenever you have an opportunity to do better, you can fix it. If you're the problem, then you can be the solution. If things just happen to you, it's out of your control and you're just going to follow the path of least resistance. So be humble and to whatever degree you possibly can, take all of the blame all of the time. And you think to yourself, oh, that's gonna make me so unpopular, everyone's gonna, no. You all know that whenever you see somebody acting humbly, you admire it. Whenever you see somebody who recognizes their own smallness and powerlessness, you see something beautiful. But there's a trick psychologically that the devil plays on us 
where he says, if you self-deprecate in a way that's true and good and holy, if you do that, then people are going to think less of you. But the fact of the matter is, the more people are humble and the more they recognize their own failings, the more that people tend to esteem them. It's the strangest thing. But the less we think of ourselves, typically, the more other people think of us. We don't need to sing our own praises. We need to be silent about our own virtues, refer all the glory and all the honor to Jesus Christ, and then take as much blame as we can because that's what Jesus did. He bore our sins in his flesh. He took the sins of all of mankind upon himself and died for them. He took the blame. He took the punishment. So we as Christian men need to do the same and take as much of the blame for the things going on as possible so that we have a chance to fix them and so that we can redeem the sins of many men. Next thing, and this is incredibly important for Catholic men, and I see a lot of Catholic men fail in this area and they make this mistake thinking that they're going to be saints or going to be spiritual without their body. That's not the way it works. God gave you a body and he wants you to use that body for his glory and honor. And a healthy body generally is better able to glorify God than a sick one. Health should be the goal. One of my friends moved out here fairly recently and he was a little bit of a skinny guy, but he was working out with me for a while. He became my gym partner and we would go to the gym a few times a week and lift and I showed him how to lift and I walked him through some workouts. And so he's now able to do all that on his own. But he put on 10 to 15 pounds in a few months while he was there. And lo and behold, he quickly got a girlfriend and got engaged after he'd done that. So it's important to keep in mind that we as Catholic men are bodies and souls. We have to take care of both. And if both aren't firing on all cylinders, we're going to be hindered in our ability to do God's will. Obviously, God can send sicknesses and God can send deformities and God can send all these things. And Christ has redeemed them so that he can make us holy through those but generally speaking, if you're a healthy adult male, then you should behave and act like and look like and feel like a healthy adult male. So if you're looking for an excuse to get back in the gym, this is it. This is your sign. Go get in shape because how healthy your body is affects how well your memory and imagination work and that affects your prayer life. Somebody who has a disciplined body is more likely to have a disciplined prayer life. And the next point, and this is really important for somebody who struggles with anxiety, our struggles with feeling like they can't do the things that God wants them to do, or somebody who struggles with the political parties and everything going on, all the nonsense there, and they feel like they're just small and inconsequential and unable to do anything about it, you have to get this right, and it will make those problems melt away, and it'll make you feel more complete, more whole, and ultimately more at peace. I used to feel a lot of pressure and a lot of anxiety whenever somebody who was close to me and my family or one of my friends would sin or do something that I knew was wrong. I felt like I needed to step up and save them or I needed to convert them. And I can't. I can't. Jesus has revealed to us that without him, we can do nothing. I can do nothing. So if you feel this anxiety towards loved ones or towards the world in general, what you have to learn to do is surrender. And this is an incredibly practical and incredibly powerful tool. What does it actually look like? I get that question a lot. How do you actually surrender things to God? Well, you start by just saying it. You say, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, I surrender this situation to you. I surrender my friend to you, my family to you. I cannot do anything to help them because I am small and weak. But you can, Lord. You are powerful. You are good. You are prudent and provident. You can help them. So I surrender them to you. I admit my own nothingness. I admit my own weakness and I give them to you, Lord. Do with them according to your will. I know that you want them to be saved. I want know that you want them to repent even more than I do. So I recognize your power, your sovereignty, and I surrender it to you. I recognize your goodness and your loving care for me and for my whole family and for the whole world. And I surrender that to you. And if you do that, what you're ultimately saying is thy will be done. You surrender your will and all of the circumstances and all of the people you love, you surrender everything to Jesus and you trust that he will do a better job of taking care of it than you could have. That's the key. That's surrender. You give Jesus everything that you can. The things that you can control, the things that God has given into your hands for you to control, you do the best that you can with those and you align your will with God and you surrender those things to God in that way. But the things that you can't control, the things that you have no influence over, your prayer does have influence. And in order for your prayer to be fruitful and effective, and in order for it to work, you have to say, thy will be done. I surrender this to you. You take care of it. I am too small and too weak. That's how you actually surrender. 
And this is the foundation of the entire spiritual life. If you get this right, you will be able to start to see God working in every single moment of your life, in every single situation, in every single instance, in every single relationship and conversation you have. You have to surrender those to God, give those to God, empty your hands, pour out your heart before the Lord, and he will take what you have given him and turn it into something beautiful, something much more beautiful than what you could have done on your own. Because odds are, if you're a man out there watching this, you probably are holding on to some control over something in your life. You are squeezing onto it so hard, you're white knuckling it, and you just won't give it up because you think you can do better with it than Christ can. In your heart, find that thing and just open your hands to God. Be like Abraham. Abraham sacrificed everything to the Lord, even his own son he was willing to sacrifice. Abraham poured out his heart to the Lord. He opened his hands before the Lord and he said, Lord, I trust in you. I know that if you want me to have sons through Isaac, you will raise him even from the dead. Have that kind of faith and surrender. Give everything to Jesus, knowing that he cares for you. Next thing that you need to know, and I know this isn't something that's popular for men. <laughs> it's something that a lot of men don't want to hear, but need to, is that you are loved. You are immensely loved by Jesus Christ, and you need that. You may want to say, like some sort of Sigma male, that you don't need relationships. You don't need human connections. You don't need da 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 That's a psychopath mentality. You are a human being and you were made for community. You were made to love and to be loved. You need community. Do not try to do it alone because you will fail. And even if you succeed, you'll succeed alone and you won't have anybody to share your victories with. Be very intentional about forming relationships, friendships with good people who have your best interests in mind. You need that. You need it. And if you do not have it, this is a wake-up call. Text somebody who haven't texted in six months and say, hey, try to develop a relationship with somebody. You were not made in isolation or for isolation. You were not, and you need human connections in order for you to be saved, in order for you to be happy and holy. And you need to recognize that you are a beloved son of God, and he has made you in his image and likeness, and he has made you for something great. He does not want your complacency and he hates your mediocrity. You need to be something. And in order for that to happen, you need to have friends. Good, holy, sincere friends. Nobody does it alone. If you want to be a husband and a father someday, this is incredibly important to make sure that your family runs well and that you are a king in your household and not a tyrant. You have to learn to encourage and to empower people under you so that they can grow and become virtuous and become the men and women that God has designed them to be. If you're a father and you're always looking at the negative side of things and you're carping and you're demanding and you're focusing all of your attention on the negative side of things, then negativity is what's going to prevail. You have to learn to encourage, to strengthen, to fortify the virtues that your wife and your children have. Good leaders are more encouraging than they are nitpicky. You have to learn how to encourage well. That could be something as simple as intentionally giving two compliments a day to each person in your household. Focus on some activity that you want to see increased, you want to see multiplied, and thank them for that and compliment them on how well they did. And let's say they didn't do a perfect job. Let's say that somebody's a five-year-old and they're wiping down the counters or something like that and they miss a spot. You don't want to say, oh, you missed a spot. You did a terrible job. Go back and do it again. That's not helpful. What did you just tell the child? Well, the child probably put forth some effort, and they probably did a fairly good job. They're just not capable of doing it perfectly yet. And you just told them that their effort was not good enough and was not appreciated. Now, there are obviously times you have to call out failings. I'm not saying not to do that. But focus on what is good in what the child did. And even if the child didn't give their best effort, if you compliment them on how well they cleaned the table, they're probably going to at least feel guilty for not giving their best effort. And your attention and your focus is towards growing their virtue, growing their self-confidence, and not focusing on their weaknesses. So we have to learn as husbands and as fathers to fortify our family with our words, with our actions, with our emotions, with our intentions, because it's very easy sometimes to be task-driven. I'm so guilty of this myself. 
I want to do this thing. I have to do this thing. And I have 20 minutes to do it. And I got to go do my deal. And you just forget that your wife is a real person who loves you and sometimes just needs a hug or needs a nice word of affirmation. And you forget about your children. You're walking from point A to point B and my two-year-old comes up and grabs my leg. And my temptation basically is to (laughs) essentially kick her off and go do my job that I was going to do anyway. But recognizing that your family has needs and if you want to strengthen them and empower them and fortify them, you have to communicate with them with your words and also with your emotions, with the way that you speak and the way that you smile and the way that you walk around the house. You have to have all of that oriented towards building up your subordinates, building up your wife and your children so that they can grow in virtue and become the people that God has destined them to be. Listen, do this and take nothing else away from this video and you're going to see your entire life transformed. Pray five decades of the rosary every single day for the rest of your life. Make that commitment right now. Give those 15 minutes to our Blessed Mother in Heaven every single day, and you will not regret it. I promise you. Our Lady has promised to grant you anything that you need through the recitation of the Rosary. And if you give to Mary, she is never outdone in generosity. So do that. Pray five decades of the Rosary every single day. And if you take nothing else away from this video, take that. Because if you do that, the rest of your life is going to start to fall into place. Your habits are going to start to shift. Your desires are going to start to shift. Even if you don't get rid of your bad habits overnight, which some of the men I work with do experience that. But even if that doesn't happen for you, you're going to stop wanting to fall into your vices. And you're going to start to want to develop virtue. One man I work with, he said his desire to watch filth on the internet decreased 90% the first day that he prayed the rosary. And he's been able to stay away from that ever since. Men that I talk to online, they all say that if they're praying the rosary faithfully, the temptation to watch filth on the internet decreases. It is a remedy. It will purify your memory and your imagination because if you grew up in today's culture, your memory is full of garbage and we all know it. We need to ask the Blessed Mother to purify our minds, to purify our memories and our imaginations. And then we need to fill our memories and our imaginations with good things, with meditations on the birth of our Lord, meditation on the resurrection of our Lord, meditation on the crucifixion. That's what we need to fill our minds and our hearts with. And the rosary is the perfect way to do that. There is no prayer more meritorious in the eyes of God than the Holy Rosary, with the exception of the seven sacraments. God has given Our Lady a tremendous, tremendous amount of power here and now. And we need to take advantage of that. Christ has handed over the rule of his kingdom to the queen, the Blessed Virgin Mary. And we're seeing that. We're seeing that. Ever since the Middle Ages, we've seen a continuing increase in devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary. And why is the church encouraging that? Because she knows what's good for you. And what's good for Christians right now is to turn to the mother of God and to entrust everything to her, to give her everything, to lay our entire lives at her feet. That's why the church encourages us to pray the rosary so much, is because that's the perfect way to attain Christ through the Blessed Virgin Mary, through imitation of the highest creature that God could create. St. Augustine says that the Blessed Virgin Mary is the mold of Christians. Yes, she is the mother of Christ and she formed Christ in her womb, but she is also your mother. And she is forming you right now. You need to be docile in her hands and turn to her with everything, with everything. And go to Jesus through Mary because Christ has established that that be the most effective way in our day and age. So what do we as young men do with everything I've just laid out in this video? I hope you've taken a tremendous amount of value from this video. I tried to sum up everything as quickly as I could to give you the most valuable parts of my entire life in a relatively short video here. So this is what we have to keep in mind if we are Catholic men. The church is weak right now. We must be strong. If we follow Fatima at all, we know that the final battle between the kingdom of heaven and Satan is over marriage and the family. And if we want to win that battle, We have to be strong fathers and husbands. We have to be saints. We have to be real Christian men. No more of this half in, half out 
No more of this going to church on Sundays and then doing whatever I want for the rest of the week. No, you were not made to live a double life. You were made to be solely, completely, 100% Jesus Christ's servant. That's what you were made for, and that's where you will find your purpose. We have to take back the family, and we're going to do that by taking back fatherhood. So if you are a young single man out there and you want to be intentional about becoming the man, the husband, and the father that God has created you to be so that you are ready to lead your wife and your children to heaven one day and to become saints, then please check out the link in the description and schedule a conversation with me and I will see if there's anything that I can do to help. This is for a very limited time and I'm not able to accept everyone who applies, but if you're interested in becoming that saint, then please Check out the link in the description 